This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. June 3rd, 2002. Werner von Rosenstiel, the German-born lawyer and American soldier, speaks to the Jackson Center about his days as an interpreter working with Justice Jackson at the Nuremberg Trials. Nuremberg at the time of Justice Jackson in 1945 and Nuremberg 2001. And that is the time when Nuremberg thinks about its past, the greatness of the time that we all have witnessed and that our president has just shown you in all of its glory and all of its horror. What we saw first were, was a considerable part of the what I think was the film of Leni Riefenstahl. But now I want to tell you that I will allow myself precisely 45 minutes. I have here my clock, and at the moment I reach 45, the show is over. <laughs> it has to be because I would like to have the opportunity that you can ask me questions, not only about my life, but what I've displayed there, which is interesting. For some time, I have pla had planned to write something about my life, and uh, I started by writing the book, which has been published, namely, The Tales of an American Soldiers. And I can start out by saying that it is easy for me to write anything because I have thousands and thousands of letters. I do not throw away a letter. I keep it because it may come in handy. Most of the time it does not, but sometimes it does. And so let me say that I will not dwell at all on my how I got to Nuremberg because suddenly I was there. But I came upon Justice Jackson for the first time in my life very shortly after Pearl Harbor, because um, at that time there was an announcement that Eleanor Roosevelt and Justice Jackson, who had just been appointed to the Supreme Court, would attend a big affair for enemy aliens at the Waldorf Historia Hotel in New York, where we would learn what was ahead of all of us who suddenly, by the events of the 7th of December had turned into enemy aliens, I was one of them, and I was delighted to hear a man of Justice Jackson's persuasion gave us a kind of an assurance that we all needed, namely he said, we are not going to change anything at the moment, we are all going to register you and tell you that you are not going to stay, go very far away from where you are registered, and if you want to go, you better come and tell us. And then he said something very important. We will go over all of your records very carefully. Those who are harmless will be left untouched. Those where we have doubts, we will bring them before a tribunal, and the tribunal will decide whether they are going to be locked up or go free. And Justice Jackson made a memorable remark. He said, we are not going to make the same mistakes that were made in 1917 when in their enthusiasm to show national pride, they decided to change the name from sauerkraut to liberty cabbage. <laughs> and so that was all I knew about Justice Jackson. And of course, I read in the newspapers, the American, uh, the Stars and Stripes, that he was coming. And I was very pleased because I thought he would do just fine as far as I was concerned. And I was not at all disappointed in, it, in the least because it was becoming very obvious that he was a man who knew what, what he was doing. And recently I read the report that he wrote on June 6, 1945 to President Truman and told him how to run a trial. And it was a model that I saw very quickly, even before I arrived in Nuremberg. 
And there are two events that I should mention. At the end of the war, I was in a place not very far from where I was born, about 100 miles. It was uh, in Mecklenburg. And at that time, I uh, uh, knew that impending for me was a lieutenancy because a colonel in my outfit had said, you will do much better as a lieutenant with all your legal knowledge. And uh, so I have put in motion that you will be promoted to a second lieutenant. And suddenly, on the 19th of June, I found myself on a plane to Paris, and I ended up in the front office of the judge advocate of the European Theater of Operations. He was a rather dull, full general, but uh, he had no idea what to do with a lieutenant who had an accent, spoke German and some English. And uh, I sat there for three weeks and wondering why I had gone to Paris when I suddenly received orders to proceed to Germany. And um, I was flown to Frankfurt, put in a car, and driven to Fürstenhagen. Fürstenhagen was a place that had never been discovered by the Allied forces. The Fürstenhagen was a gigantic ammunition factory that could never be spotted from the air. And why this was possible, or how was this possible? It was possible because the ac access roads were all built on metal pillars on which there was a roof, and the roof was planted with trees on top so that it looked from the air as if it was one gigantic woods in which there was nothing. And the factory was also built and had a gigantic planting of trees over it and accommodated at its height of its production something like 60,000 slave laborers. Now, the Allies, in a straight and rare moment of complete unity, had decided to transport all the records of the German ministries, the German administration, excuse me, the German administration um, to this place in Fürstenhagen, where there were suddenly the Department of Justice, the Department of the Interior, the in uh, Industrial, every German department of the management and government of Germany was there, and the, uh, the files that were, had been sent to places that were outside of Berlin, where administration was no longer possible, had suddenly uh, been brought in there, and it was my assignment to find what I could, what possibly lead to a hanging of an associate of Hitler. When I came there, I found five young men, all of them immigrants from Germany, who spoke of absolutely flawless German, and they were delighted to see me. And uh, I told them that my assignment was find what is possibly or could possibly lead to a conviction of people to be hanged and also find all the material and the, the major management code for the whole Department of Justice and then translate it into English so that a group of American workers and lawyers could use this manuscript and this translation if they were required to find files and file numbers and everything and assisted in this work. I was also not only by these five men, but by 13 captured officers of the German Ministry of Justice. So I told my five hunting dogs, so to speak. I said, go and find what you can, and let me see everything that you thought would, could possibly be of interest. And they were ferocious and wonderful. And then I called in the 13 members of the Ministry of Justice and said, I have work for you to do. They were now living in the place where the slave laborers had lived before. And they were our prisoners. They were treated nicely, given food to eat, and had warm quarters. 
And I said, I would like each one of you to write three stories. The first one is a story of your life with all your party associations, complete and don't swindle because we have captured all your records anyway. The second one, please describe your work in the Ministry of Justice, your superior, your co-workers and the people whom you commanded. And finally, write a third essay, namely, how you think the Department of Justice worked. I got all of these papers, I had a fabulous time, and discovered that I saw the files that hung Keitel and Jodl, namely, they had failed to object to Hitler's order to shoot everybody, every Allied soldier who attempted to surrender by raising his arms. He had said, pay no attention, shoot them all. And it was signed by Keitel and Jodl, and it served them right when they were hung on October 10th, 1946. From Fürstenhagen, I was translate, transferred to Wiesbaden, and in Wiesbaden was a collection center where the army brought together material that they thought might possibly serve well at a proposed trial that would take some time in the fall of 1945. It was an enormous enterprise, and it was carried out in a city one of the few cities that had not been bombed. The only accidental bombing took place when one of the German uh, V1 uh, um, uh, bombs uh, left and turned around to return to Wiesbaden and suddenly bomb exploded and caused but only minor damage. So I was there. What did I learn? I learned and incredible things because, among others, we found uh, the, all the records of Ilse Koch with which she had made the famous uh, um, lampshades that decorated her house at Buchenwald. She was the, the wife of the commander of Buchenwald and had issued instructions, if you find any prisoner with remarkable uh, tattoos, please let me know and have them sent over. And she had them immediately poisoned and then skinned for lampshades, which she thought would make attractive um, and different kinds of arrangements in her home. Well, we had the, the uh, shades, lampshades, and other similar artifacts. And then one day into the place arrived a small, gray-looking man, and uh, we were astonished who uh, he came to me and uh, wanted to talk to me, began to talk English, very poor English. And uh, I said, no, you don't have to, to burden yourself with English. Uh, German is much easier for me, too. And uh, so we began, he began, and he was very wor worried about uh, the possibility of great uh, damage being done to him if he spoke to me because he feared that the werewolves would come after him and uh, possibly the uh, uh, something equally uh, unpleasant, namely uh, the people who had been used in the First World War where they um, uh, went after them and uh, then killed them if they had spoken anything to the Allies. And I said, I did not think that there was anything like either this, the werewolves or the FEMI, uh, anything like that, because now Germany was totally and completely occupied by Allied troops. And so I said, now, what is on your mind? And he said, uh, well, I must tell you that I worked for a German construction company in the Ukraine right after we occupied it. And uh, I had a worked for a big construction company that built factories in that area to exploit the, the uh, natural uh, materials that were available in the Ukraine. And uh, this job required that he had capable and experienced workers, and they were Jewish men whom they had found in various uh, 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 in various uh, 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 groups where they in, in ghettos, and he had about a hundred men, whom he always picked up in the morning at the ghetto where they slept, 
and then he drove them to his uh, place of work. They worked, and at night he brought them back. And one day he heard from the Gestapo, with whom he had very close contact, that the next day the ghetto would be liquidated. Well, that meant that all the people in the ghetto would be killed, plain and simple. And so he said, no, you know, I cannot get my, my 100 men into the ghetto and have them killed because our work will stop. And the Gestapo said, you are absolutely right, keep them out. And so he kept them out, and on the day when the ghetto was liquidated, he went alone to the ghetto to see, or the, not to the ghetto, but to the place where the Nazis had arranged for the burial and the killing and the burial of about 5,000 people. It was at Dubno. And now he described to me in detail how he came there, stood there, and saw an enormous cavity that had been dug into the ground, perhaps uh, 10 feet deep, maybe 30, 40 feet wide, and uh, maybe 150, 200 feet long, with stairs, wooden stairs, going down there. And now he saw this whole group of about 5,000 people, of men, women, children, very old people, coming and being always stopped at 20. When 20 would step forward, they would undress completely. There were buckets where they deposited rings, jewelry, uh, uh, artificial teeth, shoes, everything that they had, and ultimately they were led to the steps and told to go down, and as soon as they were going down, there were uh, men with machine pistols, and there were boom, boom, boom. And there they were, and they, he could see already how the place was filling, filling with more and more, very often bleeding, some of them occasionally moving still. And he went on to another place where it happened, the same thing had, was happened. He, he described both of these events. And when I heard the story, of course, we all know it is the story what, that was now so fabulously presented in Schindler's List by Spielberg. But it was basically the story of the, the extermination of Jews doing the system. And it was so vivid, so so outrageously precise and it's also so competent in the selection to create the true impression and uh, I was I was absolutely devastated and said look if you want to write it I would love to translate it but I must also tell you that if you write it this way it is very likely that you will be named as a witness to appear and speak to it because it is a story that has never been in this way presented. And I gave him paper and pencils and said, come back if you think you cannot want to do, and want to do it. And after about 10 days he came and he had written it and the man was a, a narrator of, of first order. And I worked for a long time on the translation, and the translation is in the report that Whitney Harris submitted to the court, and it was the most exciting and the most impressive document that was read out aloud at Nuremberg. But he was not called about three months, or not three months, maybe three weeks after he had finished it, he came to my office and said, do you think you could by any chance help me to get out of Germany? I, I, I want to go get to America. I cannot live with the Germans anymore. Well, I said, that's difficult. I'm an immigrant myself, but uh, I will write to my professor of law and find out what can be done. I wrote to my professor in New York, and he sent me very promptly a V letter and said, there is a woman in, New York, in Washington that does this kind of work, and Herman Graby showed up two days later, and I gave him the letter and said, this is all that I can do for you. 
goodbye because I have to go to Nuremberg. And so I did not hear about Graeby until March or yeah, no, October of 1992, when I started to give with another prof with a professor of history at the University of South Florida a, a seminar about the Nuremberg trials. And Telford Taylor's book had just been published, and I saw there the very interesting footnote that Herman Graby had immigrated to the United States and had died in San Francisco in 1985 at the age of 86. That concludes the story of Hermann Graby, and now I'm arriving in Nuremberg, and the first person practically that I see was Justice Jackson in identically the same hat and coat that you saw on this film here just a few moments before. I did not see very much of him, but it was very obvious that he was running a tight ship. And the tight ship was that everything was going by the book and going very, very fast. There were tremendous repairs to be done in the Palace of Justice because it had been bombed. There was considerable bomb damage. And of course, what was prepared for the trial to come was something totally and completely beyond the conception of anyone who could possibly have thought about this. Because what the trial was going to be was for the world to see what these people in Germany had done. And for this they created a stage that has become a model. And where did they get all the technology that was necessary for it, they got it for America and had been tested in the United Nations where they had learned how to deal with people with many languages. They had learned the technique of producing equipment with which you could easily pick out one, two, three, four, five languages. And they knew all the problems that came with this. For example, that if you use this material and you spoke into it, everybody would hear what you said. Now, this presented very quickly a very unpleasant thing in a trial because imagine, for example, that there is a bunch of judges sitting as there were in Nuremberg. And one of them has the unpleasant task that he wants to go to the men's room. Uh, and he now takes his speaking tube and says, uh, Mr. President, Lord, Lord Lawrence, uh, how about a little, uh, little bit of a pause? Uh, for, this is sort of an emergency. And uh, then everybody in the courtroom will laugh, you know. They know what's going on. Even, even the judges are mortal. And so what did they do? They had two systems. The judges had one in which they communicated. And in addition to that, they had the second one with which they communicated with the multitude. And these people were all there. And it was a wonderful opportunity to learn from them and to see what they did. And I happened to be billeted before very long in a billet where four of the men who did these magic machines organized that. And they were perfectly willing to educate all of us and bring some of the equipment that was later on seen there and show us how it worked. And so, and we very often had a, a German uh, uh, friendly witnesses that were people who lived and were willing to testify about uh, the, they lived in a safe house and they came over and would talk to us in the evening. But now on the very first day I got the pass that is over there. It's a blue little blue book and it enabled me to go any place and talk to anybody including every one of the defendants and uh, I could interview them if I wanted and uh, as my superior officer, Colonel, Colonel Bailey, um, uh, took me 
around. He said, you know, the first man whom you should meet is Colonel uh, Harlan Amen. Harlan Amen is Justice Jackson's favorite cross-examining specialist. He was a U.S. Was, was a district attorney in New York and gained a great fame in the early 1940s when he succeeded in bringing or finishing off Dutch Schultz. Dutch Schultz was a, one of the famous mafia uh, gangsters and he had established an extremely successful business known as Murders Incorporated. And for $25,000, he would bump off anybody that needed bumping off, according to the mafia. And he was it who was able to find the way of evidence that nailed Dutch Schultz and I think he was happy when he ultimately uh, fried on the electric chair. And um, he was now in Nuremberg, and he was a delightful person. And, of course, he loved it when I came in, and he noticed I had a marked accent still. He said, uh, your, your German is, I presume, better than your English. I said, yes, it is. It is absolutely flawless. And uh, he said, well, you know... Uh, 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 how would you like to interpret for me tomorrow? Because I have an, um, planned an interrogation with uh, Justice uh, with uh, with Hermann Göring, and uh, unfortunately, my uh, my interpreter uh, is a very charming guy and is very good, but he's gun shy be because Göring always rattles him, and um, I think. Goering will not do the same thing with you that he does with my my uh, normal interpreter. So would you come? And I said, yes, sure, I would. And so I came to interpret for him, and it was really a very, uh, uh, it's a, it was a dull thing. I, it was interesting to interpret for a man who was a, I mean, about as criminal. I mean, Dutch Schultz is a minor figure compared to to Goering. I mean, he, he was a murderer of the, by the thousands. He had had at the Gestapo. He had no hesitation to bump off anybody whatsoever. And arrogant, aggressive, hostile. But the question was always concerning his art art collections, and so. There was no point wasting a lot of time with him. Uh, the, the discussion, uh, Hermann Goering always said, yes, 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 yes. He knew nobody would be hung for stealing, uh, stealing art. I mean, this is, would be ridiculous. And he saw this was merely a technical thing where they wanted to probe him or something. And so it was not interesting. But in the afternoon, I heard um, the testimony of... Um, Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's plenipotentiary for criminal, uh, for euthanasia, and he was the one who had ordered the killing of 300,000 people uh, who were mentally defective and were in German hospitals and institutions. And when Hitler needed beds to repair some of the wounded German soldiers at the beginning of the Russian campaign, that uh, he quickly ordered, let's kill them and give the room and the beds to the German soldiers. And at the end of this interrogation, he said, yes, I did it. And if I would be in a similar situation, I would do the same thing. Well, that same night, after I had uh, seen all of this, I came to the, um, um, to the hotel, the Grand Hotel, where the officers met, and I met Whitney Harris. And Whitney Harris was then, I would say, maybe a year or two younger than I. He was maybe 30, early 30, or maybe even 29. He was... He was uh, uh, very elegant. He was a handsome guy. He still is. Uh, I saw him uh, some six or seven years ago, and um, uh, I was impressed how well he was preserved. And um, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Whitney Harris wore a, a very elegant blue uniform. He was a naval lieutenant, 
and he was depressed. And I said, well, what, what is the depression? Well, he said, you know, uh, Justice Jackson has given me the task of writing the, guest, uh, the report against the Gestapo. And uh, I find this terribly difficult because I, I have to prove that the Nazis, the Gestapo and the, and the SSD, uh, that they killed people. And there is no way in which I've been able to find that they in fact killed. The only there is in the records the repeated word resettlement. Well, I said, Whitney, this is the Nazi way of talking, killing or gassing or, or uh, hanging or so. These are very unpleasant words. They, they don't sound very good. It's much better to say resettle. He said, you mean we could find somebody to explain to the world that the word resettlement means gassing, burning, killing, shooting, clubbing, anything. I said, no problem, none whatsoever. We are going to get ourselves out of this gigantic, gigantic place. A, a man who commanded one of those gas wagons that followed the German army, and we will... And we will ask him, isn't resettlement the word for gas and killing? And he would say, yes, certainly, that's what we were told. So we got Otto Ollendorf. Otto Ollendorf was the commander of Group A that Hitler sent into the Ukraine. And when we had him there, it was took 10 minutes, and we had an affidavit where he said, yes, precisely, that's the way it is. And at the end of it, Whitney Harris asked him, Mr. Ollendorf, would you by any chance remember how many people you, uh, you uh, resettled or killed? And suddenly Ollendorf became apprehensive. And when you see these people, um, they have sweat pearls on their upper lip, and then there is a kind of a, a pinkish stri strip comes here. It, it, it's a peculiar thing, and they, they become twitchy. And um, suddenly he caught himself and smiled and said, you know, it's awful what happens to a man. I cannot remember exactly whether it was 90,000 or 190,000 people. Well, on that, in the, those two, three days, I had seen two mass murderers such as I hope I will never see again. It was absolutely awful. And now I moved around. I did many, many other things, but the indictment was upon us. And as you heard, I served as an interpreter at the indictment. And the next day, or no, perhaps I should go back for one moment. There was an opportunity for me to meet Justice Jackson in person. Now. It was not a really great sort of a introduction. In fact, I was merely in a reception line where I shook his hands. And I got into his dinner really by a wonderful, lucky development. I was sitting in my little office. Colonel Bailey was in Prague, and suddenly the telephone rings. And there is the secretary of Colonel Fairman, who is the liaison officer between the Judge Advocate General and Justice Jackson in Nuremberg. And she calls me and says, Werner, I am in a terrible bind because I have before me an invitation from Justice Jackson to come to dinner with Colonel Fairman. And Colonel Fairman has just called me and said he cannot make it. And now I will not be able to meet Justice Jackson. Well, she was close to tears, and I could understand that. And she said, I have telephoned the secretary of Justice Jackson and said, if I would bring another officer, would that be possible? And the girl said, of course, you are a friend of mine, I'll do that gladly. And so she picked the only other officer that she knew, and I had the lowest rank that ever ate at Justice Jackson's dinners. 
And I walked in there with her. I had my hand shake, and I was absolutely enchanted by what I saw. And I had one of my great experiences that came after the dinner. The dinner was excellent. I was a perfect host for my charming secretary. And then they were separated. The ladies went into one room, and the men went into the other, where the the reinforced the drinking now took place. And we were all pretty well shot up with booze. And suddenly I stood with my arms around other people who were supporting me, and I supported them. And uh, on my right side is Colonel Andrews, the commanding officer of the prison of 1,500 or 1,600 prisoners. And uh, I have to be uh, friendly and uh, uh, pleasant, and I say to him, um, Colonel Andrews, uh, you are certainly a remarkable man. And he grunts. And now I have to say a second thing, and I said, you are a unique man because you have under your jurisdiction the whole German intelligentsia in your jail of 1,500 people. And he looks at me in his bloodshot eyes and says, a bunch of jerks, that's what they are. Well, you know that he let Hermann Göring get away, and it didn't surprise me one bit. But very quickly thereafter, very quickly thereafter, uh, namely after I had the indictment served, should I tone down, whisper? <laughs> Is this better? Can you hear me? A malfunction? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm willing to do it. <laughs> and, but now comes the day, Monday morning, when Justice Jackson has a staff conference after the service of the indictment. And this is, for me, the high point of Justice Jackson and of my life as a lawyer in this connection. Justice Jackson sits on the big podium. To his left, from me, is Colonel Story. To his right sits the general, who helps him with all the unnecessary things that had to be done and, and get paper and get uh, quarters and get something to eat and um, all, all the things that were unpleasant, they would go to the general and Justice Jackson was only interested in the legal matters. And now he says to Colonel Story, Colonel Story, what's up? And Colonel Story says, Mr. Justice Jackson, we have just received a petition from Dr. Dix, the head and the, the, the representative of the defense counsels. And they object that the indictments were accompanied by only one set of the documents, the actual documents that supported the indictment. And they do not think that they can perform their job as defense counsel properly. And uh, uh, that's what the petition is about. And Justice Jackson sits there for a while, and then he says, Colonel Story, what do you think we should do? And Colonel Story says, well, Mr. Justice Jackson, I think I would ignore it, because these guys are guilty as hell. We'll hang most of them, and I don't think, I think we're just wasting a lot of time. I do not know what happened to me at that moment, because I raised my hand. I got up and said, Mr. Justice Jackson, I completely agree with Colonel Story that that will be most likely the outcome of the trial, but I'm also certain that we will not hang any of the defense counsel, and they will be the ones who will determine whether the defendants received a fair trial or not. There was silence. And then Justice Jackson turned to Colonel Story and said, Colonel Story, 
Will you please call General Clay and tell him to send at once two companies with all the required equipment to produce the documents for the defendants that they must have? At that moment, he turned to me and said, he had no idea who I was. He forgot that I was at great at his lunch, at dinner. He didn't recognize. Imagine that. Imagine that. But he said, Lieutenant, you made such a fervent plea for the defense counsel. Will you please go over and now arrange for them to be peaceful? And I did, and I met some of the people with whom I'd gone to law school in the group there at that time. But the next thing was what you have heard here in on the, just a few minutes ago when, um, when uh, our president here read to you the opening statement of Justice Jackson in Nuremberg. But that's supplemented by my story about how he handled the question of the petition. I think gives you an incredibly clear and perfect understanding of what this man was all about. He was something that America had not seen in a long time and perhaps will not see for many, many years to come. Because he was something who had an instinct for justice. And so my time there ended. I am aware that Justice Jackson left on June 17, 1936, and was succeeded by, uh, by uh, Telford Taylor. And I know that the interest in Germany and in the world ended on October 10th, 1936, when the guilty ones were hanged, all of them except for Hermann Goering. He did it himself. And now I have to ask or answer for you the question that I raised, namely, what has the world retained of what Justice Jackson said? In America, there is very, very little that I can report to you that gives me confidence that America wants to continue on the path that Justice Jackson has laid out for us in unbelievable prose and, and persuasion. But that is not the case in Europe. And so I brought for you some documents that I picked up in Nuremberg. I have been going back to Nuremberg time and again. The man who became the judge that ran the Palace of Justice, now reduced to its original size, became a good friend of mine, and he has provided me with a continuous flow about what Nuremberg does. And what is for Europe the image of the trial? It is the bench on which the defendants sit, with the men backed by American soldiers in lacquered helmets. It was the impression of how finally some of the worst people in the world were brought to justice. And after Nuremberg caught itself and rebuilt itself to what is very close to the way it once was, Nuremberg started out on something new. And what is the new? I have displayed there a book in a red cover. It appeared this past year. And it was, has the title, The Nuremberg Learning Trial the Nuremberg Learning Trial. 
and it tells in detail what was accomplished in Nuremberg, and they have collected articles that were written at the time when the Nuremberg trials were running. And they were practically from all parts of the world, including the Germans' people who had witnessed all of it. And you should put yourself for a moment in the position of a German who had lived through the Hitler time and now sees in 1945 and 1946 the picture of the men whom they had saluted only six months ago, sitting in a box, 20 of them, totally guarded and protected so that they cannot be harmed to fight for their lives if they can. And most of them could not provide the proof that they were innocent. And many were hanged and many had to spend time. And then comes something in Nuremberg that is astonishing. When in 1900 and uh, 99, there is an opportunity to select a place where the International Court for War Crimes would be established, who was in the first row to ask that it receive its permanent home. It was the city of Nuremberg and asked for it. And they said, uh, 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 no, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do that. We give it to Holland. Well, I'm glad it went to Holland because it would be embarrassing because when the United States was asked to support it, they said, uh, 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 no, no, we don't want to. But now, when you see it, they did not give up. And so they asked that the first European Congress of lawyers ever to be held came to Nuremberg and they want to make that an annual affair. And I have their first prospectus and that is, in my opinion, a ray of hope for the future. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.